I was reading through uh, World Magazine just uh, a couple of nights ago, and I came across this article, uh, a little article on prayer, and it's a, a new company online where you can go and sign up, and for for a mere uh, $3.95 a month, uh, a computer will say the Lord's Prayer in your name every day, all month long. It's only $3.95 a month. For f They're having a special on this month for like $14.95, you can have the rosary thrown in. Now, it's not just for Christians. They actually have it for Muslims as well, and they'll actually point the speakers towards Mecca when the computer actually says the prayer in, in your name. So uh, nice to know the computer technical advancements in, uh, in the area of faith here. But uh, obviously, that's not our, uh, our concern or what Paul is talking about uh, here. Uh, again, in, in review, just very, very quickly, the uh, to think about the uh, putting on the full armor of God, re you, it can actually be broken down into things that we put on and keep on and things that we have to put on and remember daily. Uh, we have to be committed to the truth in terms of the belt of truth. We put that on and we leave it on in terms of we're committed to the idea of absolute truth, the truth of God's word and the person of, of Jesus Christ. That's not something that we should kind of be trying to figure out all the time or waffling with. We should kind of be able to get that straight in our thinking and have it remain there. In terms of the, uh, the, uh, the breastplate of, of righteousness, again, that's something that we receive from Jesus Christ because of uh, his shed blood on the cross. We commit our faith to him and by grace we are saved. And Paul says his righteousness is then imputed to us or, or given to us. That's something that we put on and, and remains on. And then the gospel that uh, of the, compared to the shoes is, again, that gospel that saves us by grace and by grace alone. So we need to kind of, if we're, we're sketchy on that, we need to go back and do a study of Ephesians, Galatians, Hebrews, Romans. I mean, there's, it's not like there's not a lot said about that or explained about that in the New Testament. There is. We're saved by grace alone. Those things are, are set, should be settled in our minds and we put them on, we leave them on so that we're not vulnerable to the attack of the enemy in those areas. Now, the other things that we went through last week, we take up the shield of faith <laughs> all the time. I mean, when we find ourselves in circumstances that, that are seemingly out of control or desperate or whatever, we see ourselves circumstantially, it just seems like uh, we're under attack, then we take up the shield of faith and say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe God because he's sovereign and he loves me. Uh, and I'm going to trust his character despite the circumstances are, that, are, that are going on uh, around me, the shield of faith. So that's kind of a daily thing. Sometimes it's a moment by, uh, by moment thing. Uh, and then we remember, again, the daily hope of our salvation that Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. Again, it's the hope of salvation, again, likened to the helmet and that's something that we need to, in a sense, put on daily as well. Even as we sing so many of those songs this morning to remind us of heaven <laughs> and that we're going to be with the Lord uh, every, every day. And if nothing else, if you got nothing else out of coming here this morning, if you were just because of those songs reminded of that, that, that would be worth a lot uh, in terms of spiritual warfare. But we, we forget that sometimes. We get focused on this life and so the helmet of salvation is something that it's kind of an ongoing thing that we need to keep, keep uh, putting on. And then uh, the sword of the spirit, which we said was a, a specific word of God for a specific situation. So that's different all the time. Uh, that Makaira, the, 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 the long dagger sword. Uh, I'm under attack. I need to know a specific word, scripture, that applies in my situation that I can look to and rely on and, and, uh, and need be memorized and so forth and keep in the forefront of my thinking. That's something that is, I may need to do daily, uh, dependent upon the situation. So they can be divided in those areas Paul says, now, once you've put on the full armor of God and you understand all of that, now you're ready to engage the enemy in battle. And how do you do that? You do that by falling on your knees. That's how you do that. You do that through prayer. It was uh, Edward Payson in his kind of a classic line. He says that 
Prayer is the first thing, the second thing, and the third thing necessary to minister. Pray, therefore, my brother, pray, 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 pray. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the idea of what Paul is, uh, is saying. And again, why is prayer so important? Uh, because it's in the context here of spiritual warfare. How are we to be strong in the Lord and take uh, a stand against the enemy and wage war against spiritual forces and stand firm in the day of evil? Well, it's going to be through putting on the full armor of God, but it's going to be through, through prayer. Listen to what Jesus says when he's engaged in spiritual warfare uh, in Matthew 26 in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, as he's praying, then he comes back to the disciples and says, Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body or the flesh is, is weak. The exhortation, the question, could you not watch and pray? I'm in over here with the fight of my life. Could you not watch and pray? How do we engage the enemy? How do we, you know, have, uh, in a sense, victory over the enemy? It's, it's through prayer, according to Jesus. Paul instructs the church at Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored. How will the message of the Lord spread rapidly and be honored? Pray, uh, just as it is, is with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. So we need to pray that the gospel, that's how it goes out, is through prayers. We need somebody to deliver the, the, the goods, but um, there needs to be somebody praying as well. And how do we take our stand against wicked and, wicked and evil men? Again, it's through prayer. Let's read our text. It's again Ephesians 6, uh, verse 18 to verse 24. And pray in the Spirit, Paul says, on all kinds of occasions, with, excuse me, on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Thy cheek is the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you everything, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. So the first thing Paul says is that our prayer should be directed by the person of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and Paul mentions again the role of the Holy Spirit uh, in our prayer life. Uh, it's, uh, what this means is that it requires us to pray more than just for the things I want or the things that I think I need or the things that are on my mind uh, at the moment or the things I might have on a list. I actually need to actually have some time when I'm just alone with the Lord, I'm quiet before the Lord, and I'm open, I'm, I'm open to uh, the Lord leading and guiding and directing uh, my, my prayers. And uh, sometimes with uh, the busyness of life and all that's going on and all the needs that are pressing, it's, sometimes it seems like it's all we can do to just to get, get through the things that are so pertinent to myself, what we'll call and look at in a moment, the idea of petitions or intercession. But Paul begins, when he talks about spiritual warfare, and when he begins to talk about prayer, the first thing that he brings up is that we need to be led by the Holy Spirit uh, in our praying. And that, that requires sometimes reading the word. And God speaks to us through the word, a principle, uh, 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 something that's going on that relates to our life or maybe somebody else's life. And uh, the, the Holy Spirit can guide us and direct us as to what to pray. And it gets kind of exciting then. And uh, one of the things that we, we try to do uh, when, we're, when we're in a group praying, certainly we can take prayer requests like we did yesterday with the guys, and we pray for those requests. Uh, but, but again, we want to do more than that. We want to just, you know, as the Lord is leading, pray for something. Oh, he prayed for that person. That reminds me of this. I'm going to pray for this. Oh, that reminds me. Well, 
Who's reminding? <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. And then when you kind of begin to see a pattern emerge, it's like, yeah, then we really know. That wasn't just me and something I thought of. The Holy Spirit was really leading and guiding and directing our, our prayer time. And that gets, that gets exciting then because uh, then we know that, hey, God has really uh, met us here. There's something going on. Our prayers are counting for something. There's something that's going to happen as a result of our little prayer meeting. Oswald Sanders said this, the very fact that God lays a burden of prayer on our hearts and keeps us praying is prima facie evidence that he purposes to grant the answer. When asked if he really believed that two men of whose salvation he'd prayed for for over 50 years would be converted, George Mueller of Bristol replied, do you think God would have kept me praying all these years if he did not intend to save them? Both men were converted, one shortly before and the other after Mueller's death. So George Mueller, Sanders is talking about him. And uh, if you want to read uh, a great inspirational book on prayer, just read a biography about George Mueller. But uh, prayed for 50 years for two friends. And one of them got saved right before he died while he was on his deathbed, we would say. And the other one got saved at his funeral. But uh, the whole point is, and I like the line, and I believe it. If God keeps prompting, I've got guys on my prayer list. I've been praying for a long, a long time. And, uh, but I keep thinking that if God's put it on my heart all of these years, in some cases, like 20 years plus, to keep praying for a particular person, then evidently he plans on, on saving them at some point in time. Uh, and uh, even though it's a long time, I'm still encouraged that, I just need to hang in there and keep praying because God's going to do something. If he's leading by his spirit, uh, then we can anticipate him acting you know, according to uh, our prayers and so forth because we know that they're according to his will. Uh, Jude 120, Jude says, But you, dear friends, build yourself up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. So our prayers, first and foremost, need to be led by the person of, of the Holy Spirit. So that requires that at some point in time in my day, in my devotions, whenever I'm going to spend time with the Lord, it's got to be more than just the urgency of the critical situation of, because we want to pray for those things certainly, but there needs to be some time where I allow room for the Holy Spirit to really uh, speak, speak to my heart. And when we do that alone, when we do that in a group, it, it really can be uh, exciting then. Secondly, our prayer should be in particular kinds of prayers and requests. Uh, again, Paul says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So what are the kinds of uh, prayers uh, that Paul is talking about? Well, when Jesus' disciples came to him in Matthew 6, they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. John's disciples taught them, Lord, will you teach us how to pray? And the Lord says, says, you should pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. And then we're familiar with what we call the, the Lord's Prayer. Now, Jesus wasn't giving that as a prayer to be said in repetition over and over again, as some have chosen to do. In fact, Jesus warns again against saying repetition prayers because he that's the, says, that is the way the pagans pray. Don't just get a phrase and say it over and over and over again. He says, rather pray like this. So he gives them a model prayer. Uh, in, in the model prayer, he gives us the different kinds of prayer. Paul says, all occasions, all kinds. So, so he begins, uh, Matthew 6, 9, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Worship. That's a kind of prayer, is to worship before the Lord. And the suggestion of Jesus is, that's how you should begin your prayer. You're going to sit down and pray. I'm not really sure how to get started. I'm kind of new at this. Start with worship. Lord, I praise your name. Lord, you're holy. I thank you, you're good. I worship. Begin in worship and praying, praising the Lord. Uh, again, that's why, we, that's why we, we worship when we gather together. We want to worship the Lord and prepare our hearts, declare his goodness and his glory and so forth before we even get any further in our study of the word. Uh, the next he says, your kingdom come. So that's a prayer of allegiance where we are aligning ourselves with God's kingdom and his purposes and, uh, and so forth. And in our study of the Psalms, we saw David and the other writers do that kind of stuff all the time, talking about what's going on in the world and the wickedness and those that are against you. But Lord, we trust you. We're for you. We're worried about your honor, your name, and your kingdom. 
And uh, as we went through uh, uh, Daniel chapter 9, which is a classic uh, prayer of Daniel there in the Old Testament. And, and we see it with, with the saints of the Old Testament. They're very, very concerned about God's name and God's honor and God's glory. It, you, just, you see it over and over again. And Daniel 9 is one of those uh, classic prayers to, to take a look at. It's in a prayer of allegiance, worship, allegiance, and then your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a prayer of submission. I begin worshiping the Lord. I pray for God's kingdom uh, and allegiance. And Lord, and I submit myself to you. There's things that, that I'm concerned about, things I want and so forth, Lord. But first I say, I've bowed my knee to your lordship. I want your, your will to be preeminent. I want you to show me what you would have me to do this day, who you would have me talk to, whatever it might be. Sometimes uh, uh, it's not, you know, and sometimes it's not that, well, does God need to hear all this all, all over again? I think sometimes we just need to say it all over again <laughs> for, uh, for our, our own self to remind us what Christ has done and, and, and the reasons why we should be submitted to him. Uh, and then he says, uh, give us today our daily bread. Now, some of us, that's where we start. <laughs> what we, again, call petition or intercession. Uh, but but uh, when Jesus taught how to pray, he says, begin with worship, then go to a legion, then submit yourself to the Lord, and then get to the point of petition uh, in, uh, in intercession. And, and certainly this is a critical, important part of prayer. If Paul says in spiritual warfare, you want to be directed by the person of the Holy Spirit, and there are particular prayers, all kinds of prayers, and certainly intercession is, uh, is super uh, important. I had just finished reading uh, back a couple of months ago. Hard to say, time flies. But it seems like just a few months ago, I finished reading a really good biography about Hudson Taylor. And, and I try to do that once in a while in my reading is just, is just pull out, you know, uh, a biography of... Uh, uh, I always think of the line. There used to be this Moody Bible Institute radio show Kathy and I used to listen to uh, uh, when we were uh, new Christians called uh, Stories of Great Christians. And it would be like an old 40s kind of radio show. And, and that's how we learned about some of these guys early on. But uh, Hudson Taylor, you read about some of these guys, Mueller and everything. It's really inspirational. Uh, it's, uh, it's good just to go back and, and read about them once in a while. And so Hudson Taylor, he's... Uh, he's uh, the mission is pretty underway in China. There's several uh, mission stations going in China. He's back in England uh, on a, and uh, traveling and speaking and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and he's noticed and discussed with his friends. There's one particular mission station there where there's a lot more people getting saved. There's a lot more people being raised up in leadership. There's just some really good things happening there uh, that the Lord is doing. They really couldn't put their handle on, is it just that guy? Is he a gifted leader? What, you know, what is it exactly? Anyway, he comes out of speaking at a church in, uh, in England, and a, a fellow comes up to him that he'd never met before and introduces himself and, and says, how are things going? And then he names that place. Oh, thing, because I understand things are going really good. Are things still, the Lord bless him? Well, yes, it is. And then this guy seemed to know an awful lot for just a guy in the crowd and not a member of the China Inland Mission about what was going on. And, um, and finally, he says, how do you know so much about uh, what's taking place over there in China with this particular uh, mission station? He says, oh, the, the fellow running that, we're classmates. So we correspond all the time. Uh, and I know what's going on, and I, I, I derive a prayer list. I've been praying for years for what's going on, and I've tried to enlist the help of other people praying as well. And Hudson Taylor went, that's why. That was the secret. There were, there were intense prayers going on for that particular mission station, and it made a difference that uh, everybody involved in China Inland Mission could, uh, could see. I wanted to uh, uh, read a little bit. Anytime you talk about great works of God and, and uh, revivals and so forth, you're always going to be drawn back to this element of prayer. The guys that are the missionologists and the guys that study church history will always be able to pinpoint a great work of God in tremendous intercessory prayer. And such is the case with uh, Charles Finney, what we call the Second Great Awakening, took place in the early 1800s. I'm going to re read a little bit from... Um, Jim Sabala's book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, because he talks about it. It's an older book. You probably get it on Amazon.com for a buck these days, but uh, been around for a while. And he says, 
seldom seen par- a seldom seen partner of the great evangelist Charles Finney during the Second Great Awakening was a man named Daniel Nash. He had a, a lackluster record of a pastor in upstate New York, and so he finally decided at the age of 48 to give himself totally for, to prayer for Finney's meetings. Father Nash, as some called him, would quietly slip into town. Three or four weeks before Finney's arrival, rent a room, find two or three other like-minded Christians to join him, and start pleading with God. In one town, uh, uh, the best he could find was a dark, damp cellar. It became the center for intercession. In another place, Finney relates, and then this is uh, Finney speaking. He says, when I got to town to start a revival, a lady contacted me who ran a boarding house. She said, Brother Finney, do you know a Father Nash? He and two other men have been at my boarding house for the last three days, but they haven't eaten a a bite of food. I opened the door and peeped in at them, and I could hear them groaning. I saw them down on their faces. They had been that way for three days, lying prostrate on the floor and groaning. I thought something awful must have happened to them. I was afraid to go in, and I didn't know what to do. Would you please come and see about them? And then Finney replies, No, it isn't necessary. They just have a spirit of travail in prayer. (laughs) These guys are on their faces before God. He goes on, "Once uh, uh, once the public meeting began, Nash usually did not attend. He kept praying in his hideaway for the conviction of the Holy Spirit to melt the crowd. If opposition arose, as it often did in the rugged days of the 1820s, Finney would tell him about it and Father Nash would bear down all the harder in prayer. One time a group of young men openly announced that they were going to break up the meetings. Nash, after praying, praying, came out of the shadows to confront them. Now mark me, young men, God will break your ranks in less than one week, either by converting some of you or by sending some of you to hell. He will do this as certainly as the Lord is my God. Finney admits that at that point he thought his friend had gone over the edge. But the next Tuesday morning, The leader of the group suddenly showed up. He broke down before Finney, confessed his sinful attitude, and gave himself to Christ, as did many of the others of that that group that he was with later on. And and church history is filled with stories uh, like that. It's it's, uh, why don't we see greater things happening, you know, really uh, here in the islands and, and across our country, and it's because... There's not enough of that kind of intercessory prayer going on. The guys in India get it. They're just more, they get the cause and effect in in the spiritual realm in terms of spiritual warfare and so forth. And one of the guys we had uh, in our home and doing uh, like a a Friday night Bible study uh, with us a number of years ago. Uh, and it was a great time. We had worship, and, uh, and he shared in the Word and some testimony what was going on with his particular ministry in India. And then uh, one of the gals that was in the church at that time came up to talk to him, and she was very concerned because uh, her husband was not saved at that time. And she'd been praying for him for uh, a, a number of years. And I happened to be kind of standing there with him and heard this whole conversation. <laughs> it didn't surprise me, though, what he, what he said. He said, um, he said, uh, First, let me ask you why, are you, why are you praying for your husband? Is it because you realize if he's not saved, if he doesn't come under the blood of Jesus Christ, he will perish in hell forever and ever? Is that why you're praying? Because that has to be the reason that you pray. And she's, yes, that's, that's why I pray. The guy's a little demonstrative. And, uh, uh, and uh, he, he goes on to say, then, then, and she says, but I've been praying for, for a long time. And he says, this is what you must do. You must pray and fast at least one day a week for a month and see if your husband is, is, uh, is saved. If he's not, then you begin to pray and fast two days a week for two more months until your husband is saved. If he's still not saved, then three days a week for, th- for the next two months until he is saved. And then if not, then fast four days a week and pray until your husband is saved. Your husband will make it past the four days because he will break down under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and he will be saved. But are you willing to pay the price and do you realize what will happen if you don't? Uh, she prayed. I don't know if she fasted that long, but I know he did come to faith in, in, uh, in Christ and is walking with the Lord today. But those guys understand a different dynamic in tr- of, of prayer. And they understand the, the need of petition and intercession and how it works 
intricately. Our problem is, is that we pray and we intercede and we don't see anything happen. We don't see anything visible, so we don't really understand. But again, if you read through some of those prayers in the Old Testament where you get little glimpses into the heavenlies of, of a battle that is taking place, and, and then we can understand better. Uh, maybe it would help you if you uh, haven't done so. Go back and read some of those early Frank Peretti books. They'll probably scare you to death, but at the same time, they're only novels, but man, they'll get you praying. They'll give you that glimpse into the heavenlies of what's going on when we, when we do engage in prayer. So that's a type of prayer. Worship, allegiance, submission, petition, intercession. And then verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Confession. Confession is a type of, uh, of prayer. In, in praying, especially through the word, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we realize there's things that are not right in our lives. Things we said, attitudes that we hold on to, and we need to, in prayer, then confess those things to the Lord and ask to be forgiven. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. In verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Prayers of deliverance. Those are important as well. I don't know if we ever even think about the fact that Jesus as a model prayer says an important part of this is, is that pray that you won't be led into temptation today. Pray that uh, you'll be delivered from the attacks of, of the evil one. It certainly, it helps to intercede for others, but sometimes we need to be reminded to pray for ourselves. And then Jesus ends the model prayer as he began with worship. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Begins with worship, ends with worship. Paul says, on all occasions, all kinds of prayers, particular prayers, what kind are they? The type that Jesus gave us in, in the model prayer. And then the third thing he says, our prayer should be perpetual. And, uh, and again, why does Paul need to exhort us to do this? It's because we don't often see things happen right away. And, uh, and we give up too, too soon. Uh, the early church in Acts 1.14 says, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They were constantly in prayer. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Is it God's will for you to be constantly or perpetually in prayer? Yes, it is God's prayer. Well, how can we do that? You know, I got to work for a living. I got to commute. I got to drive. Well, let me ask you this. Has, has your mind wandered and thought about anything else while I've been giving this message? Eh, it's amazing how you can listen and your mind can go somewhere else at the same time. You ever have a conversation with somebody and, uh, and they're talking, but you're already formulating your next question or your next thought? It's amazing how God's kind of built this thing into our heads intellectually, we actually can, <laughs> we can actually be listening to somebody and carrying on our own little conversation right in our minds. And we could use that to pray. We could use that as we're driving along, whatever we're doing. Can I give you a tip though? Don't mouth the prayer as you're walking along by yourself. That's, I, I do that sometimes. My wife says, don't, don't do that. People are going to think you're a street person. You're out, out of your mind. So, <laughs> so try to not open your mouth. Don't mouth the prayer, but, but in your mind, we have an, an incredible capability. I mean, I'm sure there's been many times when you've been talking to somebody and realize they don't know the Lord, or you're hoping they'll ask something about the Lord, and you begin to pray for them right then, right on the spot. Uh, I'm sure we've all had that experience. We have the capability. God's built it into us. Our prayer should be of a particular kind, led by the person of the Spirit and perpetual. And and beyond that, our prayer should be persistent. And Jesus makes that clear in, in Luke's gospel, where he tells a parable about it, Luke 18, that Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, 
He will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When Jesus comes back, and, uh, and uh, I believe he's coming back soon. So when Jesus comes back for the church very soon, the question will be, will he find believers who pray persistently? That, that's, that's the faith issue that's talking about. Because it takes faith to keep praying. If you don't see any budge, you don't see any... It's nice when you're praying for somebody and then they, they ask you something about the Lord. You know, I read in the paper the other thing, the story about God, and it said this. What do you think? It's like, you answer them, you're going, okay, this is working. <laughs> I'm encouraged. I'm going to keep praying. But sometimes we don't see anything for a while. And we need to just keep being persistent. And Jesus asked the question... When he returns for the church, will he find faith, the kind of faith that is persistent in prayer? And then again, the classic Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, ask and it will be given, seek and you will find, knock uh, and the door will be opened for anyone, everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be open. And again, Jesus says that we should ask and that asking involves Humility. In the Greek tense, it's a, it's a inferior asking a superior. We come and we don't ask demanding, we come asking. We're persistent, but we're the inferior asking the superior. Lord, this is what I pray that you would do, but I submit myself uh, to you. So again, prayer is persistent. Fifth, our prayer should be for those who need God's power. Now here, Paul asks for God's power to be, to be bold. Paul, the apostle Paul, He's put on the spiritual armor and walked all over the Roman Empire. Uh, he's been over two continents proclaiming the gospel. Five times he received 39 lashes on the back. That means on Paul's back, there's 195 scars for being beaten for the cause of Jesus Christ. Do people go through those things today? They absolutely do. I can think of a lot of people that have been beaten more than the Apostle Paul. Uh, there's, uh, uh, that's not the point. But the point is, even after Paul is everything he's done, done the miraculous, stood before kings and emperors proclaiming the gospel, in prison, out of prison, shipwrecked, saved by the Lord, he says, when I'm going out and when I'm before others, would you guys pray for me? I have a prayer request. Sure, Paul, what's it for? Boldness. Huh? <laughs> that just floors me because uh, it tells me this. If the apostle Paul needed prayer for boldness, he's not saying, I'm praying this for me. He's saying, would you guys pray this on my behalf? I think in prayer, we need other people praying for us if we follow what he's saying here in spiritual warfare because in spiritual warfare, sometimes something happens and we're intimidated and we're not as bold as we should be. And at those times, apparently... We need somebody else, others praying that we would have, have boldness. I was watching, watching the news uh, <clears throat> last night, and there was, a, there was a show on one of the news channels where the, uh, the guy that was the, the, uh, uh, the moderator of the whole thing was kind of an open forum. He had a group of people, and he was asking them different questions, primarily political and stuff. How many people think this? How many people think that? Kind of have a show of hands and, and ask their responses. It was, it was interesting. Uh, and, uh, but one of the questions he asked was, um, how many of you are, are religious and have faith, but you find yourselves being more and more intimidated about sharing your faith? Three quarters of the people in the room ra raised their hand because there's an attack, right? I mean, through the media, because of political correctness. Do you have to be careful on the workplace sharing your faith? Yeah, yeah, you do. Uh, somebody might give you, uh, give you a, a hard time. Uh, yeah, in the military, you've got to be very, very careful these, these days. It's kind of got to be invited. It's got to be, you got to have to kind of be careful. Uh, it's very interesting. There's, there's a whole group of people in our culture uh, that are out to try to eliminate any mention of God, prayer, Bible, Jesus, any, anything else uh, in the public arena. They don't want it in speeches. They don't want it at high school graduation ceremonies. They don't want it on monuments. They want it anywhere. And you know what? I think it's working. I think it's working. I think Christians, by and large, are not as bold to share their faith in Jesus Christ as they were in another time, just because it was easier because most of the people were Christians. <laughs> it was easier. But again, things weren't so easy in Paul's day either with the, the government that was over here, him in terms of the Roman Empire. 
And so he says, in the context of spiritual warfare, the importance of prayer, one of the things that he needs prayer for is that he would be bold. And I would say if the Apostle Paul needed prayer for that, man, we, we really need it uh, as, uh, as well. I know that I do. Uh, secondly, Paul asks for God's power uh, for prayer as an ambassador. He says, I'm an ambassador uh, in chains. And we know that he was uh, on more than one occasion. On one of those occasions, he writes this in Philippians 1.12. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what, was, what has happened to me, his being in prison there in Philippi, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard, that's all those Roman soldiers that are getting saved, uh, and to everyone else, and I'm in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and, and fearlessly. Paul says, I'm sitting here in prison. I'm in chains, but you know, hey, praise the Lord. God's doing good things. In fact, I'm an ambassador in chains. They chain people to me that I get to, uh, to, to share with. Uh, nothing would hold him back. But he says, would you pray for me in that? Paul's not saying, this is all a piece of cake. They can beat me all they want. I don't feel a thing. But that, he's just a guy. Paul is just a regular guy. And uh, I <laughs> like the, the little, the, the little uh, illustration of the, the little girl walking into the, the cathedral with the beautiful stained glass windows and, and seeing all of them and then being in Sunday school the next day. And, and the teacher asked something about uh, about who are the saints, you know, that we talk about in the Bible? And she says, they're the ones that the light shines through. Because <laughs> they do in the windows. That's who she was seeing. Those uh, stained glass windows were known as a comic book of their times because they were built for a society that was illiterate. And those were the Bible stories that they would, uh, that they would see. And Paul says, I'm praying that as an ambassador in chains, I would have the boldness to let the light of Jesus Christ shine through me. And he's saying, would you please, please pray for me? And, uh, and so that's on our list. We, we need to enlist. I think we need to enlist uh, a few people, two or three or four, that would, uh, where we could group together and pray for one another in that particular area. Because I think it's just an area where we're under spiritual attack when it comes to being bold for Jesus Christ. And so we need, we need God's power. Sixth, our prayers for missions should be personal. You say, wow, where did you get that? Well, that's in verse 21. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything. So Paul said, I'm the missionary. I'm sending him back. He's my newsletter so that you may also know how I am and what I'm doing. Personally, you would know what's going on in my life. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. So Paul is saying that when we pray, we should, all these things in the context of spiritual warfare, uh, we need to be praying, having others pray for us, but we need to be praying for uh, our missionaries. As uh, David alluded to earlier, uh, I, had, I had said in the first service that if, if this whole metaphor is about being a Roman soldier and fighting a battle, then the missionaries that are out are definitely on special ops. Uh, they are the special forces that, that go out. They have to blend in. They have to learn a language. They have to learn a culture. They have to learn mannerisms and, and the way other people dress so they can blend in like a, like a lot of our, our special ops guys uh, uh, do as well. Uh, and they're there for a particular mission. They're beyond enemy lines and it's more difficult for them. There's much less Christians around. There's much less fellowship around. There's a great deal more of spiritual oppression over them. It's, it's more difficult. And so when we pray, it's, it's great to say, oh, Lord, I pray you'd bless the missionaries out there in the world. But a better prayer, according to the Apostle Paul, is I'm sending Tychicus so he can be like my newsletter so you can know how I'm doing and what's going on and what my needs are and, and what's happening here. Uh, and that's why we, we try to make available to you the newsletters back there from our missionaries. Good to have a little card, picture uh, with the name, be able to pray for them be able to grab the newsletters. And, and most of them, when they do write, and uh, God bless them when they do, they usually list pr very specific prayer requests. Here's how we're doing. Here's what's going on in the ministry. Pray for us in, in these areas. 
So Paul says in the context of spiritual warfare, it's necessary that we're praying for our missionaries and it's necessary that that prayer be as personal as possible. And, and one of the ways that we can do that certainly is through, uh, is through uh, uh, emailing them. Some of them make that available. Some of them have websites. Uh, some of them, you know, send the, the newsletters. They uh, email them to me, and, the, and that's great. Uh, sometimes uh, they have the ability to, to come home. We mentioned the newsletter from Taz and Christ, uh, Christine Oliver. They, they've been in, uh, in Japan now, in Osaka, uh, I want to say for about uh, 19 or 20 years. Uh, but they don't have the finances to even come home for a visit. They haven't been home in, I don't know, eight, nine years. They've got it to stay, so they just stay. Uh, so they've been gone so long uh, that people don't uh, really know who they are. Daz used to, uh, I thought he was going to be my protege, and my Timothy, to take over the singles ministry that uh, I was doing at Calvary Honolulu. But uh, he tells a funny story in that, uh, that newsletter about uh, going down to take the test to become a Honolulu policeman. He was, uh, he was a Marine, did three years, probably led about 20 of his buddies to the Lord, uh, other Marines, uh, while he was here at uh, uh, Kaneohe. And he uh, uh, thought about missions, thought about the uh, police force, went down and, and, uh, and took, took the test. But he said he, he drank a really big Coke, a soda, right before he went in to take the test. And it's, uh, he says it was an easy test. It was multiple choice. It was no problem. He was making his way through it. He got about uh, 40 minutes into the deal. Uh, and he realized, <laughs> I'm not going to make it here. So he goes up, the guy giving the test. Is there a bathroom around here? Yeah, it's down the hall. And then turn right and then turn left. He says, by the time he got to the bathroom, it was so far away and he got back again. The guy says, two minutes. So he had to look at the last 10 questions and go, B, 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 B. He just made them all Bs. Hoped he got uh, something right. He scored 88% on the test. You needed 90 to pass. He says, so God used a, a really large Coca-Cola to get me to the mission field. <laughs> it's a great story. It's in his newsletter. Uh, but again, as, as personal as we can become, the, the better off and the more effective our, our prayers are, are going to be. Again, it's the truth that gets it all together, the breastplate of a non-compromising life understanding the gospel of, of peace, a shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, a sword of the spirit. Seven is, I just throw this in on my own, our prayers must be planned. Our prayers must be planned. Uh, if you take a trip somewhere, we're getting ready to go up here in a few weeks for Josh's graduation. I began planning the trip uh, over a year ago because that's when I had to book the hotel reservations. For some reason, there are thousands of people that converge in Colorado Springs all at the same time. And you have to book your hotel reservations uh, about 13 months in, in advance, and, uh, which, which I did. There's been <laughs> extensive planning. In fact, we were going over some of the details uh, just last night, Kathy and I. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that we've got that uh, Rockies-Dodgers game in. You know, it's important stuff you got to get done, you know, while you're there on the mainland. And so we've got this thing all, all laid out. I've got 16 family members coming and then his sponsor family. So there's uh, 20 of us. And then, uh, of course, she was making mention the fact that we have to kind of plan out some time for shopping. And, uh, and I, I understand that concept, you know. And, uh, and there's a great place where there's a, 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 a Texas Roadhouse steak place right next to a Kohl's. It's perfect. You don't have to wait to get into that steakhouse. It's a good hour and a half a Memorial Day weekend. That's perfect. We just go give our name and the gals go right in there. Hey, you got like hour 45. Call us and then we'll go in. And see, it takes planning to do these things. <laughs> you want to maximize your time, Right. And yet we, something like prayer, it's so important. It won't happen if it's not planned. It actually has to be scheduled. I pray this day from this time to this time or from this time to this time. You actually have to, to schedule it. And again, I think for me, I use a prayer list that I go through because I have a tendency to space out when I'm, when I'm praying and I need to be able to come back to something and keep going again. Pray through the Proverbs, go through the Psalms uh, on a regular basis. Uh, again, this is, this is meant to be uh, uh, an avenue where we get to enter into this warfare now that we've put our armor on and see God do uh, miraculous things. And then it becomes, it becomes exciting. John G. Patton was a missionary who went down to the New Hebrides with his wife a number of years ago to establish a, a missions training center. And they had just gotten it built when uh, 
It had uh, very little contact with the, uh, the tribe that lived in that particular area when one night they found themselves surrounded by them, weapons in hand, torches in hand, chanting things they didn't understand, but they kind of figured out this means they're going to kill us now and probably burn the whole thing to the ground. They, uh, uh, in a tremendous fear, they, it was just the two of them, they got on their knees and they began to, to pray and to intercede, <laughs> the things that we're talking about here, do spiritual warfare. And they prayed through the night, and as morning came, they, they looked out, and everybody was, was gone. They got back down on their knees, and they thanked, thanked the Lord. They had made it through the night. Over time then, men from that tribe got saved and came to faith in Jesus Christ. About a year later to the date, the chief of the tribe got saved as well. So Patton asked him, were you with that group of men that was here one year ago with the torches burning all night around our missions compound? Were you part of that? Were you here? And he says, oh, yes, I was here. He says, I'm, I'm just curious, why didn't you attack us? And, uh, and, and let me read the quote. He said, we were afraid of the men guarding the building. And Pat said, uh, it was only my wife and I. And he said, no, there were many men around the house. Men with shining clothes and swords in their hands. They stood around the building and they would not let us harm you. That's why we left. Intercessory prayer. That is the story, not of an exceptional thing that happens. That is just the normal, typical story of an everyday Christian that gets down on his knees and intercedes, in that case for himself and for the kingdom of God and the future of that mission. It, the only difference is they got to hear about something later that let them know exactly what God had done that evening. And we don't always get that other part of the story, but that doesn't mean that God's, God's not moving. That's why I wanted David to share that story a little bit. <clears throat> How long have we prayed for, for Doug? I mean, 20 plus for me, and I'm sure a lot longer before he ever got saved. And things did not, did not look good, I mean, at times. You know, homeless uh, incarcerated out, you know, back in, back out. Seems like good this time, not good. And then boom, you know, finally. But it's that persistent, uh, not, not giving up. And then, and then the, the, to see him reconciled with his son after, uh, after all these years and to see that, that, that he's a believer. And then David, and they go in uh, again, uh, this is at a mixed martial arts arena, and, uh, and there's no seats. And they, can we sit here? No. Can we sit here? No. Can we sit here? No. And then can we sit here? Yes. Who are you? Oh, that's my son. Oh, I'm his girlfriend. Oh, hey, nice to meet you. Tell me there ain't a God in heaven. You know, I mean, you know. And he orchestrates events. But the foundation of all of that, all of that is prayer. We, you know, let's go back to the opening quote. Uh, again, we, we really can't do anything until we've prayed. So pray, pray, and pray. And if we do, it's exciting to see what the Lord's going to do. But it requires persistence. I think that's the, the main exhortation here. And it's critical to the kingdom of God and the whole area of spiritual warfare. Now I praise you, Lord of all creation. Ordain the sun to rise and fall. You scatter the stars across the heavens. You come close enough to hear me call. Now I want to say, Holy is your name. Let all creation proclaim. Holy is your name. Now I want to say, Holy is your name. Let all creation proclaim, Holy is your name. Your earth is a shelter over my soul. Yeah.
should proclaim Holy is your name Now I want to say Holy is your name That all creation proclaim Holy is your name From the highest mountain I will lift my heart to the sky From the lowest valley Hear my cry shelter over my soul and my heart with wonder you fill me with the wonder of a child heal my spirit you will heal the humble and the broken mercy flows like a river mercy flows like a river running wild now I want to Proclaim, holy is your name. From the highest mountain, I will lift my heart to the sky. From the lowest valley, hear my cry. From the highest, from the highest mountain, I will lift my heart to the sky. creation proclaim holy is your name now I want to say holy is your name let all creation proclaim holy is your name for the promise of a better day we will cross into your paradise and all the chains that hold us, they're going to fall away. We will rise to glory from the ashes of our ways. We are waiting. We are watching the sky. We are praying for your kingdom to come. The night is far spent. The day is at hand Healer of nations Glorious land You will come with salvation Like the fire of you 
We will cross into your paradise And all the chains that hold us They're gonna fall away And we will rise to glory From the ashes of our ways Yes, we are waiting We are watching the sky We are praying for your kingdom to come The night is far spent The day is at hand Healer of nations surrender 